Thank you for joining us at Creative Church. We pray that this word blesses your heart and blesses your life. And if it has, I wanna encourage you to feed what's feeding you and to give to what's giving to you. The easiest way to do this is to visit creativechurch.com slash give. Thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure to click on notifications so you never miss an encouraging word from Creative Church. Good afternoon, Creative Church. We're doing good. You're feeling good? Are you standing beside somebody unbelievably good looking? If you are, then you're not in the 8.30 service. You can be seated. 8.30 service is not that pretty. If you're single and ready to mingle, do not go to the 8.30 service. They're not pretty and they're not ugly. They're sort of a combination. They're pretty ugly. And so... But they tell me this is the best service that you can have all day. This is the noisiest, the funnest, so that's cool. Uh, we love you pastors. We've been friends, as, as Pastor Jonathan was just saying, for a very long time. We've done a lot of life together, and they are wonderful people. You are blessed to have such great pastors and leaders leading you and a great team that's here. We love every one of them. And if you're new to Creative Church, then... Uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to love it here. This is a great, great place to be, great place to grow in your Christianity. I'm so glad that you're here. You're set for a good week right now. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, 2 Samuel chapter 11, we're going to get in the Word of God together this morning, and uh, let's, let's read. It says here in verse 1, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. Everyone say bath. Or whatever accent you want to say it in. Bath. I did my citizenship test the other day, so I should be saying bath. Everyone say bath. Is that better? David sent and inquired about the woman, and, and one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messages and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she'd been purifying herself from her uncleanliness, and then she returned to her house. Everyone say Bed. The woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Everyone say beyond. That's the title of my message today, bath, bed and beyond. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that it's alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to get into our lives and penetrate and bring supernatural change from the inside out. We want to we leave better today than we came in. I pray, God, that you'd work with us, work with me to have a prophetic edge on this message, that it wouldn't be just a third message on another Sunday, but it would be fresh and it would have uh, context to speak in the lives and the fabric of people that are here in this service. Give them ears to hear, Holy Spirit, what you would say to them personally and to us collectively in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Uh, one of the uh, downsides of maturity is growing hair out of random places that you would never anticipate hair to grow. Now, when I was a teenager, I was praying for hair. I remember when the first hair came up on my chest um, and it just spiked. Remember like the first one that landed under your nose and you were praying over at Alexander and you were like, remember you named that one, Harry, and you're praying that God would give you more hair. And now look, you've got a party right under your nose right there. It's a beautiful thing. And so when, you, when you're young, you just want that to happen. I need a mustache, need hair on my chest. When you get older and you've got all of that, then, then, then what happens is hair just grows. Like I had, a, I had a hair growing out of my ear, not out of here, the top. Like out of here, the top of three inches. I discovered it when it was three inches long. I had like a whip growing out the side, like a praise banner growing out the side of my face, 
and no one told me it was there. I know it didn't grow overnight. It had been there for days and no one thought to talk about it. I, I guess people were embarrassed to talk about it. There are some things in life that we are embarrassed to talk about, maybe don't want to talk about, but should actually be spoken about. I want to talk on a subject that I think we need to talk about in church, but in 2022 is probably not a popular subject to talk about. Today, I want to talk about sin. It's something that we don't talk a lot about in church, but I want to talk about that today because it impacts every one of our lives and has the destructive power to destroy us. So I want to talk a little bit about that in this message today. Verse 1 says, In the spring of the year, where the year, sorry, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Amorites, besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. He stayed at home. The whole concept here, in the time that kings went to war, David stayed at home, is like saying, this shouldn't have happened. And, and the, the thought behind the writer is almost like, what, what was David thinking? In a time when he should have been at war, didn't go to war, this was an obvious mistake in David's life. What was David thinking? And I think that's a good question. What was David thinking? thinking. I, I, I certainly know what David wasn't thinking. David wasn't thinking, you know what, I think I'll take some time out. I, I won't go to war. I'll let the other guys fight the war. I'll stay at home. I think I'll sleep in. I'll get up out of my bed in the afternoon. I'll go for a walk on the roof of my house. I will check out the kingdom. I'll see a woman having a bath. I'll notice she's attractive. I'll invite her to my house, I will take her to my bed and she will end up pregnant and start a series of very unfortunate and destructive events in my life. I, I, I can guarantee you David wasn't thinking that this one decision or series of decisions was going to lead him into such a problematic place. His inability to be where he was supposed to be, be at home when the kings were at war, led to a series of bad decisions that lent to a series of of bad events in his life. And the reality is that the whole situation was avoidable. He could have avoided it. Sin is not inevitable. It's avoidable. You don't have to live in sin. You don't have to commit sin. You don't have to do what's wrong. It is avoidable if you understand how it works. Now, sin begins in a process. It engages in an action. And then it ends with a consequence. Sin begins in a process. We call that process temptation. Then it is an action. The action is when we fully yield ourselves and we surrender ourselves to the temptation. And then it ends in a consequence. Romans tells us that the wages of sin is? James tells us that when sin is fully conceived, it brings forth? Death. The end result of sin is death, destruction, uh, decay, problems. That pain is the end result of all sin. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and life more abundantly. So God's plan for us is to have life, and not just ordinary life, to have abundant life. He, joy, peace, uh, grace. Uh, prosperity, health. That's all the plan of God for us. Jesus came for that purpose. And he says, but the enemy comes for one purpose to what? Steal, to kill, and to destroy. There's a process in sin where he robs from us, kills us, and then destroys not us, but our legacy. Jesus said, I, I, I've come to stop that from happening. And so it's a process of temptation. It's an action which we call sin. And there's a consequence that's after. Now, here's the reality. You can pretty sin up all you like. You can even say sin doesn't exist. You can pretend it doesn't exist. You, you, can, you can make it legal. You can even make it illegal for people to talk about it. But the reality is sin brings forth 
death. The end of all sin is destruction. The end of all sinful behavior is problems in your life. It may take a few decades. It may take a season. But somewhere along the line, it'll catch up with you and it will destroy you. Someone is going to get hurt out of sinful behavior. Someone. It's either David. It's either Bathsheba. It's either her husband. It's either his children or his grandchildren, someone is going to pay for sinful behavior. And it can be avoidable. You can avoid it. Sin begins in a process. We call that in this sermon, the bath. It says it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, uh, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And so David sent messages and took her, and she came to him. You may hear people say that you heard about somebody who fell into sin. Everybody, everybody heard that phrase, such and such fell? You don't fall into sin. David didn't fall. He wasn't like walking on his roof, admiring the surroundings, tripped over a cat fell off the roof, bounced off a canopy, landed on a donkey. The donkey carried him down the road, kicked him up in the air, oh, and landed in the bath with Bathsheba. That's not how it happened. He didn't fall into it. He committed. He walked into it. He walked into the sin. It was a process. Step one, should have been at war. Wasn't at war. Stayed home alone. Whenever all his friends were out at war, he spent the day relaxing. Got up late in the afternoon, goes for a walk on his roof, admiring his kingdom, admiring what he owns now, how, how awesome his kingdom is, and maybe even thinking about how awesome he is. He sees a woman taking a bath, and rather than turning his eyes, he stops and takes a good look, and he notices that she is very beautiful. This is a decision. He, he sends someone to get more information out about her. Can you check out a Facebook page? Does she have TikTok happening? What's, what's, where's she at? They come back with a message. She's married and her husband is at war. He's at war? He's not home? No, he's not at home. So he invites her over to his house and she comes over to his house. And so he, he sets the scene. He turns the lights down a little bit lower than normal. He uh, <laughs> lights some candles in the background. <laughs> Pulls up his Spotify romantic playlist and puts on a little bit of Barry White. <laughs> Being a psalmist, he's worked on a new song that probably will never get released until his son Solomon can write some songs. But the words go something like, Behold... You are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing, all of which bear twins. None of them has lost its young. Your lips are like scarlet thread and your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are like halves of pomegranates. Behind your veil. That's a line you can bust out on your wife later on. Your cheeks are like pomegranates. Always goes over well with the women. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built in rows of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your two, okay, we'll just stop it right there. That's uh, it's a G-rated service. <laughs> Solomon gets a bit carried away right there and even though it's scripture, it's probably not good for church. Each step that he took was a process towards the ultimate result of destination, which is sin. Everyone's a step away from the war, walking on his balcony, sees a woman. Everything he's stepping, it's a little bit like the prodigal son when he takes his dad's inheritance and then he walks it out, goes and parties, goes and spends it, and he finds himself up in the destination in the pig pen, eating the slop of the pigs. That's, it, it's a step. You step, you walk into sin. You don't fall 
into sin. There's a process that happens in temptation. And in every part of the temptation, there's a way out. We, we, we use the word repentance only when it comes to sin. But repentance can engage in temptation. In fact, the best time, the best time for repentance to engage is in temptation. Repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means to change direction. I'm heading east. I, like, I don't want to go east. I need to go west. I turn my back. I repent. And I walk away from the direction I was going in. Every step David is taking, he could have stopped. I shouldn't do this. I don't want to. Do it. He could have turned his back and he could have repented there. You can stop the process in the temptation and you can repent. Joseph did that. Joseph's a young man, successful, godly young man. He's given, Potiphar's given him everything. The only thing that he's held back from him is his wife. But Potiphar's wife fancies Joseph. And so she goes to Joseph, hello, hey, Joe, do you want to give it a go? And he's like, I can't handle this. And the Bible says he ran. He ran. Paul told Timothy, flee youthful lust. You can't walk into it. You've got to run away from it. It's a process in and it's an action away. But you've got to be able to turn your back on temptation. James said in verse chapter 1, verse 13, Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each one, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Each person is tempted. Each person is tempted. All of us at some point are tempted. The Bible says, no temptation has come upon you except that which is common to man. So I don't care how spiritual you appear or how spiritual you talk, you're tempted to sin somewhere. Every one of us is tempted. The Bible says about Jesus that he was tempted in all ways like us. I don't think that Jesus was tempted in the same way that we were tempted, but he was tempted like we are tempted. Every one of us is tempted. That, that's, that's common. But then... The other thing is, each person is tempted when he is lured. The Bible says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Ungodly thoughts are going to enter your mind. And what lures you may not be what lures somebody else. So while we're all tempted, we're not all tempted by the same thing. When you first get saved, there are sort of like big shelf item temptations that come. But you deal with that, and then you mature in Christ, and some of the temptations that come as you get older probably aren't even considered bad back here, but they are bad and destructive for you and the world around you. Each person is tempted when he is lured. So we're all tempted by different stuff. Some people gathered together in a connect group, and they decided, hey, listen, let's talk about our temptations. Let's talk about our struggles. Let's talk about our problems. The first guy goes, well... If I'm being honest, I really struggle with uh, kleptomania. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a thief. I, I can't help myself. I just got to steal stuff. I, if it's not screwed down, I'm going to take it. If I'm in church and some woman leaves a purse on, on, on a seat, and immediately I think to myself, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord saw my need and he's provide. <laughs> and so I take it, just take the purse. I want it. I want, I want the purse. I, I can't help. I don't know. I don't know. It's wrong. But that's my temptation to steal stuff. The next guy's like, well, if I'm honest about my temptation, it's um, naked people. And uh, I know it's wrong. I know I shouldn't be looking. But I've been trying to cancel my subscription to National Geographic for the last five years. But I just keep buying it. You know, I just keep up on the subscription. The third guy's like, well, if I, if, I'm a liar. I'm a compulsive liar. Like, I can't help myself. I just don't lie all the time. Like, the other day I told you you were awesome. Not true. You're not awesome. The other day I told you you were good looking. Not, not true. You should attend the 830 service. It's a perfect fit for you. <laughs> you know, the other day I told you that uh, I was talking to the pastor and I told him I tithed. I was lying. I, I, I wasn't talking to the pastor and I don't tithe which is a lie, I do tithe, um, but I wasn't talking to the pastor, I was watching online, which is a lie, I wasn't watching online because I don't have internet, which is a lie because I do have internet, um, I just, I can't help myself, I'm all the time, I just can't, I just, I gotta, I gotta lie, I gotta tell, I gotta tell, 
The fourth guy just jumps up and runs to the door. And they're like, hey, man, so this is a safe zone. It's a no-judgment zone. This is the planet fitness of churches. Come on, come around here. It's all good. He's like, well, why are you running away? And he's like, oh, he goes, my temptation, my temptation's gossip. I've got so much information right now. I'm just booking it to get home and get on social media, post some stuff online. So we're all tempted, but we're not all tempted in the same way. We all have different struggles. Each person is tempted when he is lured and he is enticed. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel, it's the thought, nor stands in the way of sinner. The enticement now, David sees a woman in a bath, that's the lure, but he stops. He goes from entertaining the thought, wow, she looks good. Now he's looking, he's being enticed by what he sees. He notices that she was beautiful. This is now when you lose your momentum. You're, you're walking and you can turn your back and you can run, but now you lose your momentum and the standing still is now entertaining that moment. And you entertain, I probably shouldn't, I'm a Christian. I shouldn't because of this. I, I shouldn't because of uh, oh, But it looks really good. It's, it's, like, it's like Eve looking at the tree, good for food, pleasing to the eye, desirable to make one wise. I probably shouldn't do it because God told me I didn't do it. Did he really say you shouldn't do it? Yeah, he did tell me I shouldn't do it. What did he say is going to happen? I'm going to die. You're not going to die. Oh, I probably won't die. And she's looking and she's in this. That's how it goes down in our life. You get enticed. It's when your flesh is screaming out to you that this is good and you should do it. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, stands in the way of sin, and or sits in the seat of the scoffer. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates both day and night. So our meditation in God's Word has got to be more than listening to a sermon on Sunday. It can start with listening to a sermon on Sunday. That's, that's helpful. But you've got to develop your own Bible life. It's good to worship at church on Sunday, and you have great worship here, but you've got to worship at home. It's good to pray in prayer meetings, but you need to pray at home. It's a daily experience, not a weekly event. And when you spend your time in the house of God and the things of God, you start to exchange your desires for God's desires. The Bible says that God will give you the desires of your heart. He'll transform your heart. I, I, I've hid your word in my heart so I won't sin against you. I'm exchanging my thoughts for God thoughts, my ways for His ways, my desires for His desires. I'm laying my stuff down on the altar and, and picking it up for God. And so you are, you can... Avoid it by changing the desire of your heart. But self-centeredness will lead you into a place of sin. The, 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 the servant came up to him and said, this is Bathsheba. She is a daughter and she is a wife and they're both on your team. And David didn't care. Because I'm a king. I get what I want. I don't care about anybody else. I don't care who I hurt. It's self-centered, selfish desire. The Bible says we're all tempted, but God, God always makes a way of escape. David's way of escape was this warning. Don't do it. Run. But he ignored the warning. He got in the bath. He ended in the temptation. I don't know if your family had weird things that you did growing up. One of the weird things in my family that I really only realized was like really weird was when I'd become an adult. When I, when I was like a, a young boy, my, my parents would leave the water in the bath for me to take a bath after them. I took a bath in the bath water that my dad had taken a bath in. Now, that may be a custom at your house. It's all cool. But I thought about that since then. I'm thinking... Why? Why would you do that to me? It wasn't like we were poor. We could afford the water. Maybe they were into, maybe they were into the environment. Maybe they were into stopping global, maybe they were ahead of their time, stopping global warming. You're welcome for my part. It's one of these occasions where my dad left the water in and uh, I went to get out of the bath and I went to pull the plug out and something bit me. 
And I was like, oh, I still got a scar on my finger. And I put, and my finger's bleeding. My finger's bleed, I'm bleeding. I run out of the bath into the kitchen, screaming, oh, something bit me. My mother's like, you're getting blood everywhere. Like, that was the issue. My sister's like, she's like 10 years older than me. She's like, for the love of all things holy, put some clothes on. And, and then my dad, this is what my dad says. My dad says, stops and goes, oh, that's where I left that razor blade. My dad dropped a razor blade in the bathtub and didn't bother to look for it. And I slashed my finger. I want to tell you, and talking about temptation, you got to consider this. There's always a razor blade in the bathtub. You can't play with temptation. Temptation is going to cut you at some point, somewhere, somehow. There's always a razor blade in the bathtub. Sin begins in a process but engages with an action. That's the, rebe- that's the bed. The end result of temptation is an action. Now, the rabbis taught it like this. They said sin begins out like a, like a spider's web. Just one little strand. You don't even notice it. Stay home. Don't go to war. Don't even notice. Does that sound problematic? Have a break. He'd taken breaks before. David had taken a break a couple of chapters earlier. Didn't go to war. God gave him a break. And during that break, he, he thought about the presence of God and said, we need to build a temple for God's presence. He, I'm, I'm del- dwelling in a nice house. God's presence, the ark, is in a horrible house. And so in that... So in the, he took a break, he'd taken a break, but this time was not the right time to take a break. Just a thread, didn't even see it. Then he's walking on the roof, sees a lady, having a bath. He could have turned his back, but he engages in it. It's a thread, and eventually, as the rabbis teach, each thread ends up leading to a web that will entrap you. The end result of all temptation is entrapment. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. The end result of all temptation is sin. It's an action. It's moving from a thought. It's moving from a a, a desire and engaging in an action. And here's the thing about the flesh. A.W. Pink said, the flesh of the unbeliever is no different than the flesh of the believer. Flesh is flesh. And it will search out its own desire. And we can never get to the point where we think that we're so holy and so spiritual and so spiritually mature that we're incapable of doing wrong. That is a mistake. David wasn't a boy. David's in his 50s. He's not a young lad. He's in his 50s. He's a successful man. He is a slayer of lions, a slayer of bears. He's the giant slayer. He's the captain of an army that's taken over kingdoms. He's the man after God's own heart. He, he, God says to him in chapter 12, verse 7, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house. I gave you your master's wives. I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. I gave you kingdoms. And listen to what God says. And if this was too little, I would have added to you so much more. So David is in this place where super successful and he was the most vulnerable. One person said it like this. They said, uh, if failure has slayed its thousands, then success has slayed its tens of thousands. One of the dangers that we can have is that if, if you think that you are too big to mess up, I got it all together. I'm holy. I'm, I'm, I'm a, no, no. It just All you need is a subtle change. Subtle change. Jesus says to Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Peter's like, not going to happen. Yeah, you're going to deny me three times. Not going to happen. You're like, we're not even going to get you. The rooster's going to crow. You would have denied me three times by the time the rooster crows. He's like, not going to happen. Anybody comes near you, I'll take the sword, I'll take the head off. I'm a bad shot. I may take the ear, but I'll aim for the head. (laughs) Next thing Peter hears, and he's denied Jesus three times. Why? Because his circumstances changed. It's a subtlety. So we never want to get to that point where we think we're, you know, just super spiritual. Got that like, I'm too Christian for this church, too Christian for this church. 
so Christian that it hurts. Never to get to that point where you just think that you're better than everybody else. Sin is an action. It's an active response to temptation. Sin is an action. It's an action that misses the target of best. This is what sin does. God says, I've got the sweet spot of abundant life. And I want you to aim your actions and aim your thoughts and aim your desires to hit the sweet spot. But when you miss the target, the, the, the word for sin is harmatia. It means to miss the target. You had an arrow, you were aiming at the target, you shot the arrow, and it missed, it harmatia, it missed the mark. You had a spear, you threw it at the target, it fell short, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, it missed the target, it harmatia. And so abundant life comes with aiming for the sweet spot of God's grace, God's mercy, God's abundance, God's plan, God's way, God's promises, God's word, God's prosperity. That's the sweet spot that we're aiming. And when you miss the mark, when you miss the mark, you harm a tear, you sin. It's an action where you're aiming, but you just miss it. And the Bible says every one of us at some point have missed it. We've all missed the mark. We've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Sin begins in a process, engages with an action, and ends with a consequence. This woman tells David, I'm, I'm pregnant. There's a consequence. Now, let me get this straight. Being pregnant is not the sin. The sin was sex with a married woman. Pregnancy is just the result. It's a biblical principle. What you sow, you reap. You sow apples, you get. You sow oranges, you get. You say babies, you get. It's a spiritual principle. And so that's, that's not the, he, he, him sleeping with her was the sin. He missed the mark, not the sweet spot of God's promise for him. But now it's a consequence. Oh my gosh. I got this woman pregnant and her husband's away at war. So her husband is going to know it's not him. So he does what most people do when they sin, they hide it. Adam and Eve, as soon as they sin, they, sin, they hid. What was done in dark should be brought in light, but what he does, he takes it in dark and does it even more darkness. And again, one of the things that in our church that we get around the wrong way. The Bible teaches us this. Whatever is in darkness has power. Whatever is hidden has power. When it's brought into the light, the power is released out of it. So he tells us to do this. When you're tempted, don't hide it. Because when you hide it, it has power, and the power leads to sin. He says, confess our temptations. Oh, how good it would be if we could get to the, ch to the church to the point where people could talk about their temptation without being judged. We, we Forget confessing our sins to one another. We can hardly talk about our temptations without someone judging us. You What? Yeah, well, that may not be your temptation, but it's mine. And we should be able to bring it out, because once it comes out in the open, the power goes out. What we do is we can't, we can't talk about our temptation, so we hide it, and when we hide it, it leads us to another one, and we just keep walking in the same direction. And we end up blowing it, rather than saying, hey, I'm being tempted here, help, and, ha and be rescued out of that situation. The Bible teaches us, when you do good works, shh, don't tell anybody, hide that. And if you hide your good stuff, then God will reward it openly. It'll gain power while it's hidden. But we do it around the wrong way. We hide our temptation and we talk about our good works where we should hide our good works and talk about our temptation. For the love of all, we, we've got to get the church to a place where we can cut it out in the temptation phase. And so David's like, I'm, I, I'm going to get busted here. So he hatches the plan. He invites Uriah back from the war. Uriah comes back from the war. He's like, hey, man, you've been missing your wife. And, you know, you've been, I, I want to reward you for being such a great warrior for me. And so, you know, I, I, I want to give you the romance package. Got you a couple of nights away in a nice hotel. And uh, here's a box of chocolates and uh, a bunch of flowers and some vino. And hey, I'll even let you borrow my Barry White CD. It's worked before for me. And, and, and I've written some things out here that I'm going to hand to my, my kids one day. And, you know, it's like, uh, he said, and, and so Uriah takes it and he's on his way to visit his wife. He gets there and he's like, I can't do this. I can't, I can't be at home with my wife. All my friends are at war. I should be at war. And he doesn't. Be with his wife, and David's plan is ruined. So David takes him out the next day and gets him drunk. 
and he falls asleep in a corner. And David's plan is ruined. So David says, I've got myself into this hole. I'm going to dig my way out, which you can't dig your way out of a hole. You just make the hole bigger. So David writes a letter, gives it to Uriah, take this to the captain of the army. And the, lies, the, the letter says, put Uriah in the heat of the battle. Find the most violent place of the battle. Put him out front and then have everybody retreat back. He's, he now goes from adultery to murder. It just gets worse and worse and worse. David and Bathsheba wait a little while of mourning and then they get married and for all intents and purposes, David's sin is hidden. No one will ever know. But God knows. When, when God exposes someone's sin, we tend to think it's judgment. You'll hear things from the church, but judgment begins in the house of God. And, and judgment does. But judgment, when it comes to God, is righteous. The righteous judgment of God is mercy and judgment. It's so you shouldn't do this, but I'm going to show you mercy. Mercy and judgment are the foundations of God. Church people just tend to be all judgment, little mercy. The judgment begins in the house of God, all judgment, no mercy. There's no mercy in judgment begins in the house of God. You can tell by your face there's no mercy. But the way God does it, see, I, I don't believe that God exposes somebody's sin to judge them harshly. I believe that he does it to set them free. Because the wages of sin is, so how do we remove the consequence of your problems from you? Now, there are going to be some problems that you create that God won't change. It's a consequence of your action. But God, God gives you a way out. He gives you a restoration. So God comes with restoration to David. First thing that God does is he gives David an opportunity to repent. And repentance is like sin. It begins in a process, it engages with an action, and the end result is a consequence. The process for David is that God sends Nathan the prophet. Nathan's a friend. Doesn't send a judge, doesn't send who somebody does. Nathan's a friend. They, they, he, he'd been involved with David earlier, uh, will help Solomon become the king. Uh, David names one of his sons, Nathan, possibly named after Nathan the prophet. They're friends. And Nathan comes not with judgment, comes with a parable. Comes to the king with a story. Hey, David, this is a story. And he's like, there's a, a rich ruler. He's got a lot of sheep. There's one poor guy. He's got one little ewe lamb. And he takes that ewe lamb and he gives him this parable. And, and, and David, David does what a lot of people do. David comes out swinging. says, David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he has done this thing and because he had, had no pity. So David comes out swinging. I can't believe somebody would do that. And here's what I found out. That people who have a lot of sin in issues in their life, tend to be really judgmental and critical of everybody else. Anybody you see online who's anti-church, anti-pastors, got a blog on why everyone else is wrong, pointing out everyone else's fault, why they're doctrinally in error, there's all sorts of things. Never ever think to yourself, man, that person must be incredibly spiritual. If you're harsh and critical on everybody else, my instant response is, I wonder what you're hiding. I never think, man, you must be a spiritual giant. Because anybody can find fault. You, you don't have to be a rocket science to, scientist to find fault in somebody. And you can find fault in me. I find fault in you. That's easy. That's easy to do. To find fault and then post it online is usually covering up for some issues in your own life that have gone sideways. I, I, don't, I don't value that as being a super spiritual person. Dave, Dave is like, I can't believe this guy would do that. Why? Because he's guilty. And then... Nathan says, it's you. And David's like, oh, well, when I say kill him, you didn't let me finish my sentence. I'm a psalmist. So I'm thinking musically. I'm thinking more like killing him softly with this song, pouring my heart out in this 
I'm, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking Psalm 151. It's a new thing I'm thinking about. Isn't it interesting how we tend to judge people by their actions while we want to be judged by our intention? Somebody else said, I can't believe that they did that. We do it. I didn't mean to do that. I can't believe I did that. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Intention versus action. He said, well, it's like, it's you. Nathan exposes David's sin to set him free. And David wants to judge everybody else. Repentance begins in a process. It's, it's helping people change direction, and it engages in an action. Psalm 51, I want to read this to you. Psalm 51, if you, if you read it in your Bible, um, everyone has a Bible? Have a Bible. Alexander, do you have a Bible? You do have one on your phone? If you were offered a paper Bible, would you take it from somebody? But yeah, you probably wouldn't. Um, no, you would. You would. I can find you a Bible. I got a friend, Rodney Howard Brown. He probably would love to give you a Bible. You know why? You know why Rodney Howard Brown would give you a Bible? Because Rodney Howard Brown cannot grow a cool mustache. Scientifically impossible for him to grow a cool mustache. No South African has. I don't know. I'm just making that stuff up. <laughs> Randomly. I don't know. I just got to. This is my third service. My ADD just kicked in. Just my Ritalin wore off and <laughs> just like that. <laughs> this, this psalm was written when, when David was confronted by Nathan. This is what grace does. This is, what, this is what a friend, this is the response that God wants. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. What's he saying to God? God, I, 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 I know I've messed up. You, you've approached me in grace. You've approached me in mercy. You're trying to set me free. God, I, 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 I want to change. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. In other words, I was born this way. I was born a sinner. I am problematic by nature. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop. I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. This is his response to grace. This is his response to God. He's like, God, I, I know I've messed up, but I need a fresh start. Here's the good news is Jesus came to give everybody a fresh start. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever would simply believe in Him would not perish. Perishing being the end result of sin, who would not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. You can have perish and death, or you can have everlasting life, the abundant life. Jesus, He came to break the curse that the devil tried to put on us through the actions of sin. God is trying to lead us into life and life more abundantly, joy and joy more abundantly. This is the plan of God. This is David's response, and I love this verse 10. Creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. I think that should be the cry of every Christian. Creating me a clean heart. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of salvation. Let me uphold me with your willing spirit. God, I, I, I know I've done wrong. I do wrong. I, I don't want to be, I want to overcome temptation before it's sin. And I want to overcome my sin if I have a sinful habit. But God, I want you to bring me to a place where I can stand before you holy and righteous. But look how this finishes. He doesn't finish it with anything else, but he says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Creating me, let, God, let me get it right. Let me stand right before you. And when I experience your grace. 
I want to help other people experience grace. I believe that Jesus wants a church that helps the world around it experience his grace. His grace, his mercy. <laughs> Repentance is a process that requires an action. In a moment, somebody's going to come and they're going to lead you in a prayer. If you're not right with God, this is your opportunity to take the first step in getting a fresh start in your life and relationship with him. If you're watching online, it's a first step. This prayer is a step in the right direction. It's not the whole journey, it's just the first step of receiving God's grace. But the end result is that we would help other people discover that grace. And look at, look at what God says in Acts chapter 3, says verse 19, Repent therefore and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. Anybody glad that your sins are blotted out? How many people are grateful for the blood of Jesus? Give me a wave of your hand this morning. You're glad your sins are blotted out. And that times refreshing may flow from the presence of the Lord. The abundant life begins when you turn your back on the pig pen. You turn your back on the sin. You turn your back on the temptation. So I'm not going, and I'm going to run into the presence of Jesus. I'm going to run into the arms of Jesus. I'm going to run into the forgiveness of Jesus. I'm going to run into the grace of Jesus. I'm going to run into the compassion of Jesus. I'm going to run into the holiness of Jesus. I'm going to run into the mercy of Jesus. I'm going to run into the arms of Jesus. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Repent, be changed. Why? So times of refreshing would flood into your life from the presence of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for Your Word today. Lord God, I pray people would leave here encouraged, inspired, Lord God, with Your mercy and Your grace. I pray, God, today that people will be inspired to turn their back on their past and walk into a brand new future. I pray today that people will be inspired to love on a broken world around them and not reaching out in judgment or criticism, but reaching out in mercy and grace. We have a world that's hurting. We have a world that's broken. We have a world that's lost. We have a world that's walking in a pathway of destruction. Help us to have the wisdom. Help us to have the grace. Help us to have the right words to say, to turn lives around and have them run into Your goodness and grace. Lord God, help us teach transgressors Your ways. Help us to help them experience Your love and mercy. God, use us, we pray. As You heal us, use us to bring healing in the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.